Hi, Linda, we're gonna be starting the forum in just a moment. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our forum on racism, trauma, and what's next. I'm Stacy Woodland. I'm the CEO of YWCA Tri-County Area, and I'm pleased to have you join us. And I'm so pleased that we have partnered with sister YWCAs across the Commonwealth. We have with us YWCA of Bucks County, YWCA of Greater Harrisburg, and YWCA of Greater Pittsburgh. And we are thrilled to be joined by a panelist of law enforcement officers. Um, we have a chief of police of Pottstown with us and we have uh, state troopers with us also. And um, I hope that we can have a wonderful and engaging conversation this evening. We have started this discussion and this forum and this series as part of our work to eliminate racism and to be present with the community as we start to do the necessary work to educate ourselves and each other about how we can get at some of these important things. So I'm going to turn it over to the officers and ask each one of you to please introduce yourself. I'm gonna start with Chief Mick Markovich and I'm gonna ask when you introduce yourself if you could talk a little bit about your police department and also talk about the, the community that you serve and, and the people that are part of that community. Hi, is my speaker on? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. My name is Mick Markovich. I'm the chief of police with the Pottstown Police Department in Montgomery County. Um, Pottstown is a, a small borough uh, between Philadelphia and Reading. It's approximately five square miles, and we have almost 23,000 residents. Um, I would say it's primarily an urban environment um, with a very diverse population every race, every religion, gender, sexual orientation, and ethnicity uh, you'll find in Pottstown. Um, the racial makeup of the borough, and these percentages are approximate. Um, we're about 72% white, 19.5% African-American, um, less than 1% Native American, less than 1% Asian, um, less than 1% Pacific Islander, and 5% from two or more races. Um, our police department is made up of 46 police officers. Um, right now, we've had some recent officers retire, so we're down to 43. Um, of those 43 officers, we have eight minorities, four of them being women, two African-American, one Pacific Islander, and one American Indian. Um, we also employ one LGBTQ, um, and one Spanish speaking officer. In the police department, we also employ seven civilian processors or dispatchers. Uh, they generally handle our prisoners for us when, when they're brought in. Um, of those seven, two are women, two are Latino and Hispanic, and one of those is LGBTQ. Um, as I said, we're a 46 man police department, which is relatively small. Um, for this end of Montgomery County, or I'm sorry, large for this end of Montgomery County, but small in the overall scheme of things. Um, we handle about 25,000 calls per year. That doesn't include traffic stops. That's actual calls for service. So though we're small, we're actually a very busy police department in Montgomery County. Um, all of our hiring is done through the Pottstown Civil Service Commission. So the Pottstown Police Department has actually very little to do with the hiring process. 
Uh, recruitment is done through our HR department. Um, I know they post on social media, on the social media job advertising market. And we, we also uh, put out to community, um, community members. Um, we post through Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Um, our biggest problem right now, at least what we see in Pottstown and from what I hear um, throughout the state, is not a lot of minorities want to be cops right now. Um, we gave a test in October, and uh, we only had 79 people show up for the written exam. Um, 22, 23 years ago, when I took the test, 350 people showed up for the exam. Um, so that's our biggest problem right now is... Uh, not recruiting, I think we're getting the message out there. We just don't have a large return for people coming to take the test. Um, I don't think our, our requirements are actually very lax. Um, we require that you be 18 years old, have a high school diploma or GED and a valid driver's license. So we're not really, we're not losing any people because of our requirements. And uh, that's all I have about that, unless you have any questions. Thank you so much. No, I, I don't have any questions. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, we're going to go to Trooper William Butler. You have to unmute yourself, Trooper Butler. Okay, can, can everyone hear me? All right, so I'm Trooper William Butler. I'm with the Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, I'm with the uh, Community Services uh, Unit here at Troop K Philadelphia area. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been doing police work since 2010. I graduated from Philadelphia Police Academy uh, in 2010, and I simply signed up uh, because I don't like bullets. I, you know, I like protecting those who uh, are afraid or, or not in a position to protect themselves, and that's just why I do it. It may sound corny sometimes, but that's why I do it. Um, uh, so I went through Philadelphia's Police Academy. Uh, I was employed uh, through Temple University. I worked with them for seven years, and then I switched over to uh, Pennsylvania State Police in 2017, and I've been doing this uh, for about three years now with the uh, Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, just a little bit about the department. Uh, the Pennsylvania State Police is a state police agency. It's the first. It's, it's one of the first of its kind. Uh, it was established May 2nd, 1905. Um, we basically provide police services to municipalities that do not have police coverage. Uh, there's currently 2,560 police mun uh, municipalities in the state of PA. There's currently 1,100 and uh, 1,117 law enforcement agencies, and state police cover 87% of uh, uh, PA's landmass. Uh, we are currently at 4,500 um, troopers. Uh, we have 90 stations, uh, 16 troops, and we cover four areas. Uh, just a little bit about the nature of Philadelphia. Um, so it's slightly different. Uh, it's a different style of policing um, versus the, the other areas of Pennsylvania. It's considered a line zone uh, station. So we basically patrol the interstates. Uh, Interstate 95, 70 skit, 76, the Schuylkill Expressway, uh, State Route 422, Interstate 476. So our, our policing is slightly different. Um, and as far as as far as Philadelphia, uh, it's, it's pretty diverse. I would say it has uh, I would say it has forty five point one percent blacks, thirty five point eight percent whites, thirteen point six percent Latinos, and seven point two percent Asian. Um, and I would say that our our police department is pretty diverse. Um, that's all I have for you. If you have any further questions, I'll I'll answer them. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna to go to Trooper Kelly Smith. Thank you for joining us. Hi everybody. As Stacy said, my name is Trooper Kelly Smith and I'm with the Pennsylvania State Police. Like Trooper Butler, I am also community services officer, but I work in the Troop H area, which encompasses Adams, Cumberland, Dauphin, and Perry and Franklin counties. So our job as community services officer is really unique. We do the community outreach and public relations for our respective areas. I'm also the camp director for our youth summer program, Camp Cadet. And the whole goal of that program is promoting positive relationships between law enforcement and youth in the communities that we serve. I've been with the state police since 2013. 
if you told me when I was younger that I would was going to grow up to be a police officer, I would have told you, get out of here. You're crazy. That's not on my radar. Um, I was working in nonprofit at a YMCA, actually. And that's where I learned that I felt it was my mission in life to serve. And I realized with the state police, I can do that on a very large scale. So I signed up and here I am. And it's been the best decision of my life. Um, I work in the troop age area, like I said. And it's a little bit different than Trooper Butler's area in Philadelphia. We have some largely populated areas and also some rural areas. We cover a very large area. Like I said, we have six stations and five counties that we cover. So it's a very large land mass. It's a very busy area. And it's also very racially diverse because we have so many different kinds of communities within our coverage area. Thank you. And um, Trooper Smith, can you tell us a little bit about the demographics of where you, of your troop, where you are? I don't have the statistics, unfortunately. Trooper El Guerma might have that, but I apologize. I don't have the, the racial demographics of my area. We cover those uh, six- I meant of your, of your police department. Oh, of my police department. Yes. Um, we, like Trooper Butler said, we have a complement of about 4,500. I don't have the breakdown of the racial demographics. I know currently we're about 5% female. So if you do the math on that, it's only about 2,200 feet, 220 females out of that 4,500 complement. So it's not a lot, but I don't have the racial breakdown for okay. you. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And so it was a perfect segue to Trooper El Guerra. May I call you Ishmael? Definitely. It's okay, because I'm going to mess your last name up like 50 more times. Don't worry about it. No Thank you so it. much. Hello, everyone. I'm Trooper Ishmael Gomra of the Pennsylvania State Police Heritage Affairs Section within the Equality and Inclusion Office. Our unit is dedicated to prevent, monitor, and respond to hate crimes in Pennsylvania. We pretty much cover the whole Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Along with that, we offer law enforcement training and assistance in these fields. Our units work with municipal, state, federal agencies, local governments, community organizations. I know that you heard a lot about Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, I'm glad that I'm uh, one of their troopers. The reason why it's a large department, multiple units. And back to your question, you asked about the minorities within the troopers. The complement as of May 2020, was 13.61 of the minorities. And actually the next class coming up is gonna be one of the highest diverse classes. As far as if we reach what we want as the diversified uh, uh, police agency, no. Nah. We wish, however, and we strive to do so. Our next cadet, as I said, will be the highest diverse one. Uh, as far as our recruitment, uh, activities, we target, uh, we attend conferences, workshops, meetings with women and minority organizations. We target uh, historically black colleges and universities. We have good relationships with a lot of the organizations, including NWACP. And, uh, and absolutely, we do believe that we should reflect the diverse, uh, diverse community that we serve. And uh, uh, as far as our requirements, the most thing that will come to mind is we need 60, we look for 60 college, college credits. However, if you are an officer with experience or a military personnel, that changes. And if you have any questions for me. No, I don't have any questions yet. There's gonna be a whole bunch of questions that are coming in a few minutes. So I thank I think all of our law enforcement officials for being with us today. Um, I expect that your jobs must have gotten a lot tougher um, with, with the murder of George Floyd and the rest of the things that have happened. And so we appreciate this opportunity to really um, start to talk to you and, and understand more about what you do. And so that said, I would love to introduce or have my uh, YWCA colleagues introduce themselves. I'm gonna start with Angela Reynolds from YWCA Greater Pittsburgh. Good evening. Um, I'm very um, happy to be here with my sister YWCA's and also with our law enforcement personnel. Angela Reynolds, I am CEO of YWCA Greater Pittsburgh. And this is a very timely topic for me as well because I was recently appointed to the city of Pittsburgh 
um, Mayor's Task Force on Police Reform. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Angela. And now I'd like to um, have my colleague, Mary Quinn from YWCA Greater Harrisburg introduce herself. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to just, if I quickly could, just thank Stacy um, for putting this together. She has spearheaded this. She invited us all to the table um, to be a part of this. And I really, Stacy, thank you. You've been a long time um, peer of mine and someone I really look up to. So I really appreciate um, being invited here. I'm very humbled by the invitation and just um, just to all our law enforcement officers, um, chiefs, uh, troopers, uh, thank you for your service, for keeping us safe. It, I have called on you many times um, and needing your, your help. So I know that we all share that sentiment. Um, as Stacey said, I'm Mary Quinn. I'm the CEO of the YWCA of Mary Harrisburg. And um, we're, we're one of the, I think we're all fairly large YWs. Um, but we do do a variety of services from childcare to domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking. We have a 110 bed shelter on site um, and do a lot of employment programs as well. So we have a pretty big catchment area even outside the city. Um, so we serve you know, a diverse, uh, not only ethnically, racially diverse client, um, but even rural and urban. And, and I know I'm sure that um, troopers can speak to this, Trooper Smith, um, you know, there's, there's different needs for, um, some of the rural individuals that we see versus the urban. So uh, it's a unique area and um, yeah, and I'm just happy to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And you give me too much credit. It's really been the YWCA Tri-County Area team, Sheree McDonald, Ashley Faison, Kelly Grosser, Sarah Stump, they've all worked so diligently to put this together. And um, so I was gonna thank them later, but you made me thank them now because I, <laughs> the credit. Um, and so, and then I want to also, I just want to say, and I think I neglected to say, the mission of YWs, all YWs across our country, is to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. And so it is in service of that mission that we've started this these important discussions. Um, the dignity for all peace is just as important as the elimination of racism. And so we hope that this turns out to be a really productive conversation, one filled with respectful dialogue. And so I just want everyone to feel welcome and comfortable. And, um, and so with that, I would like to introduce um, our last YWCA colleague, Guillaume Stewart. He's with YWCA Bucks. He's the executive director of YWCA Bucks. And Guillaume, when you finish your introduction, you can launch right into the next set of questions. Okay, awesome. Thank you uh, for that intro. I'm excited to be a part of this important dialogue. I'm grateful to be with my colleagues, happy that the uh, law enforcement community is here. And um, I think they have a lot to offer and, and will be an important part of this conversation. So we're gonna jump right into the questions uh, in the interest of, of time. And my questions are gonna focus on diversity and awareness in the police force. And I wanna pose this question to all of our um, amazing law enforcement officers that are a part of this conversation. Um, we understand that the job that you guys do every day is difficult, it's not an easy job. Um, and so we wanted to ask what are officers doing to support the mental health of um, officers within your police departments? What kind of mental health supports are they getting during this particular time? And how is that mental health treatment helping them respond to the community needs? start on this one. So our department, the Pennsylvania State Police, has recognized that this is a very stressful time in our line of work and mental health is so important. We have a members assistance program. Any personnel that is experiencing a hardship either personally or professionally can speak to a MAP members assistance program representative. These are troopers that receive extensive training in dealing with trauma and counseling it's a great connection because some of the things we see and experience in this line of work, it, it's tough. We're not robots. The things we see and experience when we go out to scenes, we take that home with us. And sometimes it's really hard to turn that off. So the only ones that can really truly understand what we're going through is another police officer. So these members assistance program representatives are troopers as well. Anytime there is a serious incident, 
a MAP representative, they're contacted and they speak to the officers involved. And now it's more important than ever because it is a very tough time in our history. So talking about talking about what's going on is really important. That's awesome. With thank you for sharing that um, important insight. Would any of the uh, other officers like to uh, share share their experiences around this question? Yes, sir. I'll just add one point here, real quick. Um, as far as MAP program, which is Member Assistant Program, actually I used it myself on incidents, and you can actually trigger it yourself or if you're involved in an incident, your uh, commanders or your supervisors can actually initiate it. And there are actually other programs like State Employee Assistance Program, which is similar. There are surveys for mental health to further promote okay. mental health within troopers as well. That's awesome. Do you find um, that a lot of the officers take advantage of this, this resource that's available to them? Absolutely. Our MAP representatives, are, they're awesome and they're very easy to talk to. And like I said, they go through extensive training in, in how to deal with trauma and responding to really tough incidents. And I know many troopers that have taken advantage of this member's assistance program. Because like I said before, the things we experience are very, very hard. And even if there's something personally that's going on, um, our members assistance representatives, they can refer them to other outside agencies, other counseling agencies, um, drug and alcohol counseling, um, mental health counseling. They have um, contacts that they can put our, our members in touch with. That's great. Uh, thank you guys for responding to that. Um, the other question that, that, that the committee has for you guys is how are districts acknowledging the needs of their employees of color and the needs for services concerning men mental health for the internal conflicts that may be presented within the various departments. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in and uh, just yes. say that at least coming from a smaller department and being the chief, and I've done my entire career here, um, we have different outlets and aspects and, and um, counseling that the that the officers can go to, but it's probably one of the most overlooked issues with police. Um, when things get bad, when things get busy, what we do is we ask the officers to work harder and have less days off and it puts more pressure on them and more pressure on them. Um, just coming back, going back to March, March around March 17th, we had the, uh, the pandemic hit and in the borough of Pottstown, Everything was shut down in Borough Hall. All the other government agencies were shut down, including Montgomery County, except for the police department. Mm -hmm. um, so we were not only stuck answering more police calls, but answering calls for license inspection, codes, complaints with the for the finance department. Um, so the officers were working longer hours and harder hours. Um, and then with the murder of George Floyd, we had several protests in Pottstown, all good ones, all positive ones. Um, but just like anything else, you have to be prepared for the bad also. So there were several weekends where officers weren't allowed to have off, even though they were scheduled to have off. We had to have them here and working. Um, but we do have outlets for them. Um, things like first call, first responders counsel, drug and alcohol. Uh, we do have a department psychologist. Um, we have a department chaplain, Bishop Debnan, who's always available to talk to the officers. Um, and specifically for the minority officers that we have, um, I actually sat down with them. We don't have a lot of them. It's only six to eight, between six or eight of them. Um, we don't have anything specifically for them. Um, but to be quite honest, they were almost offended when I asked them that. Um, did they feel that they they needed something different or were they going through something different? Um, and I'll tell you the most offended were they women, um, wanted nothing to do with being considered any type of separate. Um, so what we all offer the officers as far as counseling is straight across the board um, and the same for everyone. That's great, thank you. 
uh, would any of uh, the other officers want to respond to that question? Okay. Um, since we have all of you here, another important question we wanted to entertain is what um, diversity and inclusion trainings are offered um, to officers within your department and, and the various uh, police agencies you guys represent. Is there any diversity and inclusion training that's available to, to your uh, staff, to your officers? I can start this one. So I actually just attended an unconscious bias training and I've been speaking about it, I think, to everybody in my department that I've come across. It was offered by the Commonwealth, so not just for the Pennsylvania State Police, but all Commonwealth employees were open to be able to take this online training. And like I said, it was absolutely fabulous. I learned so much. It was so eye-opening. Um, it wasn't mandatory. It was an elective training that I, I um, submitted to sit through, but like I said, it was offered not just to troopers, but to all Commonwealth employees. That's great. Thank you very much. Gee, um, can I jump in for one second? This is Stacy. I just want to say sure. we have some questions regarding some of the answers that the officers were giving. Um, okay. One, there were a couple questions about the member assistant program. And one question specifically was, um, is there stigma from police toward police who use the program? And how extensive is the training for the member assistant, uh, the people who are administering it? So I can start with that one again. So I, I don't believe that there's a stigma from police with, with act, using the member's assistance program because, I, like I said before, we know that this job is hard. We know that the incidents that we go to, some of them are very tough to deal with. And we're thinking and feeling people too. And it's really hard to turn off those emotions. So we know that we need to talk about it. Using member's assistance is not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of great strength because you can't keep those emotions inside of you. You need to talk it out. And that's a really great sign of strength when you um, contact a member's assistance representative. I'm not a member's assistance program representative, so I don't know the exact training that they go to. I do have friends that are in the program and I know that they're going through trainings pretty constantly right now they're doing a lot of online training because of the pandemic, but I know that the training is pretty intense because like I said, when there's traumatic incidents, they're contacted so they can speak to the officers involved. And also if there's personal things going on in people's lives and troopers lives that they might be contacted about. So I do know that they do receive a ton of training, but as to what it exactly is or hours or, or how it's scheduled, I can't speak to that. Thank you so much, Kelly. I just want to do a quick plug. YWCA does implicit bias training. Back to Jim. <laughs> thank you, Stacy, for that commercial. That plug. <laughs> um, thank you for that for, for the answers that we got around the training. Um, we think that that's really important. Um, can we talk a little bit? Can you guys talk a little bit about um, how, if at all, are police officers bias or ethic beliefs? beliefs assess before they are employed by the various departments. I can talk about this in a little bit. Uh, I do understand that uh, our, our Pennsylvania State Police uh, hiring process is very extensive. Um, you must first apply. All right. So in, in order in, 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 in order to apply you must first meet the minimum requirement. So, okay, you got to have a valid driver's license. You have to be a, a, a Pennsylvania resident, U.S. citizen, uh, diploma, GED, all that jazz, all right? Then, then you're eligible to apply. So once you apply, you go through a very rigorous hiring process, uh, which takes about uh, a year and a half. You know, I'm speaking from experience. Um, so you, you, you apply, uh, you take the written exam, um, and if your written exam is, is good enough, you'll, you'll advance to the, uh, to the oral exam and then which you're placed on a, an eligibility list. So depending on how well you score on the written and oral, uh, you're ranked as far as your eligibility. Uh, and then, uh, you get, you go to, you advance to physical readiness, uh, tests which is uh, universal for both male and females. And then you have an extensive background, uh, background check. 
Um, and in, in addition to a background check, you have what you call a polygraph as well, which they actually did away with, uh, I believe a year and a half ago, and then they brought back because they knew they, or they believed that it was invent and uh, advantageous to the hiring process, you know, so they didn't use it. They didn't use the polygraph solely to determine uh, an applicant uh, worth, but they used it in addition to an extensive background check. Um, and then you go through a medical, uh, medical check psychological uh, processing as well. So, and, and even after all that, you know what I'm saying? Then you, you know, and if, if there, if, if there is a process that need to be repeated, like the psychological process, just to make sure a, uh, a person is mentally fit to be an officer, you know, to enforce the laws fairly, you know what I'm saying? They'll, they'll then revisit that, that process. But there is a, a very extensive background check that is done. Like I said, it takes about a year and a half uh, about a year and a half to two years before a decision is made uh, uh, for, you know, to, for someone to be um, allowed to enter into the police academy. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that was really good information. Would uh, any of the other officers like to share or, or respond to that, that question? That was a really comprehensive answer and it really helped, I think, and more what that process is. I guess I'll follow okay, up on that. Okay. Go ahead, Ismail. Okay. All right. All right, sir. I just want to add uh, two points. As far as psychological examination, that includes two different test batteries, which screens for biases. Then there is an evaluation of any tattoos suggestive of bias or association with any hate groups. I want to just uh, elaborate on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah, it's important. I didn't know that. Um, anyone else would like to respond to that question? I think it's an important question. And your responses, both of the officers' responses have been really helpful for painting a picture of what the process looks like for people who want to become police officers and what they have to uh, engage in to get through that process. So thank you for that. Anyone else want, want, want to respond? I was just going to respond and say, um, Ismail brought it up, the psychological um, evaluation is, is key. Um, and that would bring out, normally bring out any issues that anybody had. Um, but the, the interview, and I'm sure the state police is very similar of a stress type interview, um, basically to vet the candidates based on their personality traits, integrity, honesty, and, and ethics. And somewhere along the line, and if not during that process, the polygraph will usually get them you will bring out any biases or any um, ethical issues that candidates have. Okay. That's great. Anyone else? What, what um, training opportunities do you think would be uh, beneficial to police officers and folks trying to become police officers? What, what trainings do you think if you had uh, at your disposal would help you guys perform your job, you know, more effectively? Um, uh, uh, okay. I was just gonna say that that's kind of a, it's kind of a tough one, but um, I think most of the officers now are exposed to culture, di cultural diversity and sensitivity training, um, some kind of trauma training, um, and some kind of basic crisis intervention uh, training. Um, yeah, I know the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission also um, offers uh, an excellent training on diversity, harassment, and respect. Um, we're really trying to pull to get them along with the Pottstown NAACP to come to Pottstown for all of our officers to have that training. Um, but I, I think that anything dealing with diversity um, and people, uh, it's important trainings to have right now. It's awesome. Thank you. Um, would any of the uh, panelists, our officers, like to respond to anything in the last uh, few minutes of my time and the questions that I had? Anything you wanted to bring out based on these questions before I uh, pass it on to our next uh, facilitator? Yeah, so I can just add up as uh, personally, I know. Uh, some classes that were given 
by our commander from Heritage Affairs section, uh, Lieutenant Slayton, William Slayton. Um, some of them are given to PSP cadets, some for troopers, some for other uh, local enforcement agencies, and that's involved cultural diversity awarenesses, awareness, implicit bias awareness, racial profiling awareness, cultural competency, hate crime recognition, and the history of policing in America. Those are courses that I'm aware of um, you are uh, given by our section of Heritage Affairs. Okay, great list. Um, another question as, as my time closed that the committee was concerned about is, can you describe the de-escalation de techniques that are used within your individual uh, districts and police uh, departments? Can you speak a little bit about the uh, de-escalation? Because we know that you guys have to deal with a lot of uh, conflicts as a part of your job. Can you speak to the de-escalation techniques that are utilized? Okay, I'll try to talk about it just a little bit. Um, like that would basically revert back to our use of force uh, continuum. Um, so let's say for an example, uh, a law enforcement officer arrives on scene uh, for maybe a domestic. Uh, the first de-escalation uh, method would be, hey, mere presence. The fact that I'm here, an authoritative figure you know what I'm saying? That is a form of uh, de-escalation, and that that's a part of our use of use of uh, use of force continuum. Um, next would be verbal commands. All right. So so if I'm asking two parties to separate. You know that is a form of de-escalation. Uh, next is basically control holds. So you're just basically going up the use of force continuum. Um, just trying to, to, and the sole purpose is to gain compliance, uh, you know, or gain control of the situation. Um, and if control holds, uh, is not sufficient, uh, then you go to less lethal force. All right. So, so it's all these steps are basically progressive, uh, depending on the totality of the circumstances and the circumstances, mind you, are, are forever changing. All right. Somebody said, uh, Dancing is, is like uh, split second, uh, or dancing is like bank robbery. It takes split second decision making. And I can say that policing is like bank robbery. It takes split second decision making. So, so as a situation or circumstance is unfolding, you got to be able to discern which uh, method of force, which is only using a reasonable and necessary amount of force to bring a situation or a person under control, you got to be able to discern which one is going to be most effective. All right. So like I said, de-escalation, uh, when I think of de-escalation, I'm thinking of our use of force continuum. So you have mere presence, you have verbal commands, and then it's working its way up to control holds, uh, less lethal uh, force, and God forbid, deadly force. I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure if I did. No. Yeah, I think you did. That was really, um, I think, a comprehensive Okay. Um, Oh, yeah. Uh, would, would, would any of the other officers like to respond to that? I'll question? just add on what Trooper Butler said. So using force is actually really rare in police incidents. It's actually only a small fraction of a percent of all police encounters. Most of the time when we're dispatched to an incident, we can solve it or handle it with just our words. It's all about what we say and how we say it. We're trained in de-escalation techniques to diffuse situations without ever having to use any of the tools on our belt. We realize how serious the tools on our belt are. We receive much training to be safe, and know how to properly utilize them. No police officer ever wants to use any of the, the tools that we carry. We're always so thankful and grateful every day that we come home and we don't have to. So again, it all comes down to the words we say and, and how we say it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, that was a question that I think your both responses really helped me get, get an understanding of what that process looks like and how de-escalation impacts your work on a daily basis. So thank you to both of you for, for answering that question. My last question in closing, because my time is, is almost up, is um, can you guys speak about, uh, do you have the authority to discipline or remove 
uh, sanctioned officers that might be uh, abusing their, their, their power as a police officer. Can you talk a little bit about what that uh, discipline process looks like and how that gets um, acknowledged, it gets dealt with and how they're removed? I guess I, I'll address this. Um, in Pottstown, we have a uh, very strict discipline code um, that uses progressive discipline, uh, meaning there's a scale based on how many an, how many times an officer has um, committed a particular offense okay. um, and what he can get for that. Um, in our discipline uh, code, an officer can be given a, a counseling, which would just be simple, something simple like saying to him, the supervisor saying to him, stop handing your reports in late, um, get them in on, on time by the end of your shift, uh, you know, knock it off. Um, then there would be an oral reprimand, um, which would actually be documented in their file. A written reprimand would actually, which would actually be a little bit more serious and documented in a file. And anything above written reprimand in Pottstown would be suspension. And if it would lead to discipline, that would all be monitored by the Pottstown Civil Service Commission and the Pottstown Borough Council would have to sanction that. Um, so in my time as chief, um, it's only been two years, but we've had officers suspended. Um, when that happens, I bring that to a council meeting. Of course, that's after the investigation has been done and the decision to suspend um, has been made. Um, it gets approved by the mayor, and then I bring that to borough council, and they make the final decision on the suspension. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you to each of you for answering um, the questions that, that we had for, for my portion. Um, I think they were really good answers, and I, and I learned a lot, and I think our listeners learned a lot. I want to um, pass the baton over to my colleague, Mary, um, for additional questions. Thanks, Guy. Um, so I speak the language of the YWCA, so if this doesn't quite resonate, um, we can get a little bit more uh, context to it, but YWCAs definitely have a unique lens um, in which they, they view racism as a form of trauma. So, you know, we talk a lot about trauma-informed care when we're, we're dealing with um, uh, just our own knowledge base and, and meeting individuals where they are, um, but we're, we're definitely wanting um, to take our expertise with trauma um, and help people connect it to racism that communities of color typically experience um, over many generations. So thinking of trauma in a very generational year um, after year, family after family, um, having this kind of mistrust with the police, um, how are police, when you know you're going into a community faced with stories and, and children are fearing um, your presence, like, you know, where I grew up, and in you know my kind of white context, police are you know that's that's who you called, and I know that that's not always true for many communities of color, and those that kind of perpetuates into younger generations of actually sometimes fearing the police. So how do you how do you respond to that when um, you know you're going into a community of color, um, and there's a lot of children around. I can talk about that a little bit. Uh, so I grew up in the uh, West Oak Lane section of Philadelphia. Uh, it wasn't the roughest area of Philadelphia, but it, you know, it, it was considered a moderate to high crime area. Um, and just to answer that, I mean, growing up in, in some of the individuals uh, that, that I, that I knew, you know what I'm saying? They had this, uh, this negative uh, look on law enforcement and for many different reasons, you know what I'm saying? And me knowing that growing up and experience certain things, you know, it allows me to address, you know, address the community just slightly different. A simple, a simple handshake, you know what I'm saying? A simple handshake might even do the trick, you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes uh, individuals uh, might look at law enforcement as if we're above the law and we're not above the law at all. And, and the fact that, you know, if I'm going to a community uh, 
and I see individuals, you know, I might, I might give a head nod. I may say, Hey, what's up fellas? Or what's up you guys? Or, or a high five, something like that. And that's my response as small and minute as it is, it works. And it just shows like, Hey, this, you know, Trooper Butler is cool. He seems like a cool guy. He said hi to me, you know, and that's just, that's my response to that. I, I can tell you in Pottstown and in, in a lot of the communities, we encour encourage our guys to get out of their car and do foot patrols. Um, you got to get out of your car and you got to talk to people. And it kind of breaks down that barrier when you get out of your police car and you start walking down the street, when you start standing on the corner and talking to people. And uh, it kind of breaks down that us versus them or that we and they. Um, and believe it or not, when, when kids see the officers out there on foot patrol, and I'm speaking from experience from when I was on patrol, um, they approach you and they like to talk to you. There's always some hesitancy, but getting out of your car, um, getting involved in the community, um, we always send our officers to any community events that's, that are available. Um, we actually started a program at the end of last year called Create with a Cop. Um, it was just getting ready to get off the ground and then the pandemic hit, um, but just a program to get kids working with cops, no matter what it is, even if it's just playing games. Um, it was actually created by Art Fusion um, in Pottstown and um, to, to create art projects, anything to get the kids to work with the police. Great, thank you. Just to piggyback off what the other two officers said, it, it all comes down to conversations. And I think when it comes to kids, it's a golden opportunity to break down barriers and, and to change the narrative. I'm part of the Big Brothers Big Sisters program called Bigs in Blue, which is pairing students with a law enforcement officer. And my little sister, she's going into fifth grade and I've been with her since she's been in third grade and she's at one of our inner city schools. And at first, when I would come into the school, they would be like, oh, well, why is there a police officer here? And there would be some of that, that trepidation. But as the years went on, they know me as Kelly. I'm jump roping on the playground and doing double dutch and playing basketball. And they look at me as Kelly. They look beyond the uniform and they've seen me as a friend now. So it's just simple acts of having lunch, jump roping, playing basketball, um, being her running buddy for Girls on the Run. It's little things like that that really make a big difference and help to break down those barriers. And also having conversations about the law enforcement field and, and letting them know the work that we do. Great, thank you. I mean, I think all those, those answers actually speak to good leadership. I mean, things that we wanna model in our, our personal and professional lives. So thank you. A lot of you talked um, about, I know um, Trooper Smith, you said that you did an unconscious bias training and it really helped you and uh, kind of broadened your horizon. Do you think, I, I mean, this is kind of a tough question. Um, do you think that there is a different treatment um, by police officers for individuals who are minority or, or non-minority, white versus community of color? Any preferential treatment, I guess, or, or differences in how you respond, react, treat? I guess, and, and I'm speaking for Pottstown um, and for our officers in our community. I, I don't, our officers deal with a great deal of diversity every day. Um, they're used to dealing with everyone, people of color, minorities, women, every religion. Um, I don't see um, a division in Pottstown as much as you see maybe across the country or across the world. Um, by no means are we perfect, not at all. Um, and we'll always do things to get better. Um, but I think we're very fortunate in Pottstown and a lot of it comes down to the community um, that we don't see a lot of those, those problems in Pottstown. Okay.
Are there standard operating procedures that exist universal, universally for all police officers, regardless of agency? Um, if so, that kind of universality of operating procedures um, regarding the, the incident um, and incidents in Minneapolis, Georgia, Ferguson, New York, do police officers follow standard procedure, in your opinion? Um, the ones that you've all been trained on? Um, and do you hold officers to the same standard legally uh, binding policies that are required for um, civilians? So, so in, in those incidents that have made the news, do you believe that police officers were acting within that universal standard conduct? I can jump on that. Um, there are federal standards, and we, and a lot of times, we work with uh, case laws. Those case laws governs uh, our actions, and procedures, and how we deal with uh, the task in front of us. However, local rules usually exist, and the DA has the last call on any uh, investigation of that uh, big. However, if you, if our agency, and I can take just a statement by our commissioner that we, that act was horrific, it's not acceptable. And if it happens here, the person whoever did it will dealt with accordingly. That is not acceptable. As far as policies and procedures go, they're usually um, different from each individual police department and police officers are held and should be held to a higher standard um, than civilians. Um, and, and I would like to say, and not just because I work in Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania is a pretty squared away state with its training and, and it starts with the state police and it filters down to the MOPEC, which is the municipal police officers training. Um, it, from the state attorney general's office to all the local district attorneys. Um, Pennsylvania has its act together when it, has, when it comes to policing. And um, I, I think if there would be universal policies and procedure, Pennsylvania would probably be leading part of the way um, to make those happen. Because, and we discuss it here in Pottstown and I'm sure the troopers have also discussed it. You know what's going on in your police department or your barracks but you don't know what's going on in policing in Minnesota or Alabama or Georgia. It's different states, it's different rules and it's different police departments. And we don't all go by other than federal case law that Ismail said, um, policies and procedures can differ greatly from police department to police department. So Ismail, I, I just wanna clarify one of your answers. Did you say that your um, department openly condemned the murder of George Floyd. Did you did you open were you, did you openly state that? Yeah, there is a public statement from our commissioner that okay. that that action is not acceptable. It's not tolerable. It should not happen. I think that's great. Did, did anyone, did the, the state troopers make any um, public statement? You guys, are you aware of anything that was publicly stated? Okay. Yeah, that's well, I think I, um, I, my questions were, are pretty uh, wrapped up here. I'm going to throw it back to Stacy real quick um, for a couple of follow-up things. Thanks so much, Mary, that was great. So I wanted to try to get to some of the questions that are popping up in the chat, if we could. Um, and I think this question would be directed to uh, Chief Markovich. What do you think that the protest in Pottstown was about? Are you hearing from community members in Pottstown that there are no problems is, is a question. I'm sorry, what was the protest about? What do you think the protest was about? And are you hearing from community members 
So I guess does the data support what you just said about like there really aren't any problems in the Pottstown community, especially does data support what you're saying? If you were to look at the numbers, would the numbers support that, you know, the percentage of citizens that get arrested or whatever is that it follows the demographics that it's not disproportionately black people, even though black people only make up 22% or any of those things. So I think the question is, you know, from the Pottstown community, have you heard that they feel like everything is goes well in the community with the police department? I can't tell you what off the top of my head, and I don't have them with, with me, what the statistics are. Okay. Um, my answer to the question is, are police officers treating people, people differently um, based on their color or their, their gender or ethnicity? Um, as far as the protest went, um, I thought it was great. Um, you know, we participated in it. Um, it was for unity. Yeah. Um, it was to say that Black Lives Matter. Um, it was to support. Um, well, to show that we all believed George Floyd was mur was murdered. Um, I don't think any police department has not uh, condemned that. Um, yes. And, and the, uh, overall, the Pottstown community has, instead of pointing fingers at the Pottstown Police Department, they embraced us as part of the change and part of the solution. And that's what I'm referring to in that. All the pro protests in Pottstown from the major one that Sunday that had to be at least 2,000 people, if not more, um, to the one that was several hundred people the Sunday before and to the, the smaller ones on the weeknights. Um, they were all positive um, and they were all projecting the, the message of unity and togetherness, I would say. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, there's another question in the chat that asks, do we know the standard uh, operating procedure for police departments in relationship to uh, President Obama's 21st century policing task force? Do, is that still um, a viable task force? I mean, I'm sure it isn't under our current administration, but are some of the 21st century policing things that got put into place, are they still viable in any of your work? Not sure. Um, I, I read it and if I could switch off my computer, I have it actually right on my computer, but a lot of it involved um, holding police accountable, but also community policing. And I think police departments adopted a some of that and just because president obama isn't in in the white house anymore um doesn't mean police departments don't still practice those methods okay. um so I, i'm sure that they still are i i can't couldn't repeat them for you right off the top of my head though no thank you so much no i appreciate the answer to the question um and i think um there's one last question about is there an independent oversight committee that monitors of officers. And I would ask this of you, um, Chief Markovich, and also maybe Ishmael, maybe you would be able to answer. Can you just repeat the question again for me, Stacey? Sure. Is, <clears throat> is there an independent oversight committee that monitors misconduct of officers? Not in Pottstown. A wide one? Not in Pottstown, there is not an, uh, an independent oversight committee. Um, okay. But like I said, borough council um, yes. monitors that stuff and they are elected officials, civilians from, from the Pottstown community. Okay, thank you so much. Ishmael, is there one that you're aware of? As far as right, right now, when there is an investigation usually, like say a trooper involved in a, in a high incident, a shooting, for example, mm -hmm. there are investigators within the state police, however, they are from other stations. That's the first thing. The second thing, there is a communication as of right now going on toward that uh, between commissioner and the governor uh, to kind of implement some changes on that way, in that side. Thank you so much. And I think there's one more question left in this section. Since the murder of George Floyd, what, if any, updates in policy 
have been adopted in your respective districts? And if there's not any, then that's fine. I can jump on that. I actually one affected our heritage affairs section. I used to be uh, part-time. We were just two and our commander. Now we are four. We're covering, uh, we are four full time, we're covering the whole state. And that's just one thing that I witnessed. And this is good. And uh, all of us have different backgrounds and we can relate to different communities. We have different language abilities to help and to open those kind of line of communication and to bring that feedback back to our stations and to our supervising commanders and affect some change within. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have an answer? We have like one more minute left in before I need to turn it over to my colleague, Angela Reynolds. In Pottstown, we, every other year we review our use of force, use of deadly force, our use of force continuum. Um, but the death of George Floyd, we reviewed them right, almost right away. Um, the use of force, use of deadly force, and our use of force continuum. Also policies involving in custody death, positional asphyxiation, um, excited delirium. Um, we, didn't we didn't have to make any changes. We did not condone chokeholds, brachial stuns, vascular neck restraints, or anything that puts pressure on the carotid artery. Um, those would all be considered deadly, deadly force by our policy. Um, but it, it definitely opened up the door to put more review on those type of, uh, those policies and the training on um, types of deaths that can happen while in custody, um, not related to the murder of George, George Floyd, but other deaths um, such as the, involving excited delirium or positional fix, asphyxiation um, just from somebody's body weight when they're handcuffed. Um, right. We need to get them up so they can breathe. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm gonna turn it over to Angela Reynolds uh, from Greater Pittsburgh YWCA. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And um, again, it's been really helpful and informative to hear the responses to the questions because it gives us a, a different side of, of the issues that, that many of us have been um, not only dealing with, but also questions that we've been receiving. So thank you so much for your responses. So I wanted to um, actually ask um, questions related to now, you know, coming into you know, like where we're going next. And, and I did hear comments before saying, you know, we, we want to promote um, togetherness and, and change and want to come to this place of unity. And that is um, very, a very exciting thing to hear. What we're looking at is that there are some differences that I noted in terms of application processes that may differ across jurisdictions, that may differ between a local police department and the state police department. So how we get there may be different <laughs> for Pottstown versus what's happening at the state police. So, and I, so I'm sorry, Chief Markovich, that I'm gonna keep calling on you to talk about those um, distinctions within my questions, but I do wanna get a perspective from a local entity and then also a perspective from, from the state entity. So the first question I have comes around the process of complaints. And so while all of you have spoken to the fact that you have training that you have policies and procedures and even looking at um, the term that was used in terms of the continuum of force and things that are not even allowed that you would automatically consider deadly force. When we see it from a community perspective, if a community member feels as though they have a grievance, would like to get perspectives from, um, from both sides in terms of what is that mechanism for being able to bring a grievance, is there a mechanism? Is that mechanism something that is known? Is it accessible to the community? So again, so if a citizen does have a, a grievance, if you could talk a little bit about that process that they would then go through to be able to make that grievance known from a local police department perspective and then for any of the troopers that would like to answer. So we'll start with you, Chief Markovich. Okay. Um, Again, not to keep 
um, harping on policy, but we have policies and procedures in place for civilian complaints, internal investigations. Um, we have civilian complaint forms um, that can be picked up at our police desk in the station or could be emailed um, to people if they have complaints. Um, any civilian complaint that gets received gets investigated, um, regardless of what it is. Um, a civilian complaint will come to me, um, and the person that filed that complaint for me acknowledges the receipt of that complaint. Um, I would tell them how it would be investigated, who would investigate it, um, the name of the officer that they filed the complaint against, because they may not actually know the officer's name. They might have his badge number, or they might just say, the officer that was in my house last night with brown hair and wearing glasses. Um, and then I would also tell them um, a timeline of how long it would be until the investigation was completed. And we usually give about 30 days for an investigation to be completed. Um, once the investigation is completed, I would send them another um, letter stating the results of the investigation. Um, was the complaint founded based on what they said and other evidence, or was the officer exonerated? And I also would state in there whether any discipline was issued or whether, whether any retraining was administered and received by that officer. Um, of course, the complaint would receive whether I was doing the internal investigation or one of the lieutenants or sergeants um, doing the investigation, they would be in contact with the, the civilian that filed the complaint throughout the investigation. Does that answer? Thank, thank you. Would one of the troopers please respond and, and what happens at the state level? If there's a complaint. Okay. Yeah, I can take that. Thank okay. you. As far as, you're welcome. As far as complaints, they can be filed at any department installation 24 hours, seven days a week either in person, by telephone, or in writing. This include filing complaints directly with the Internal Affairs Division, which is a division that takes care of complaints and investigate. The, this division investigations are conducted as a result of misconduct, allegations, which if founded, then they will give a rise to a formal discipline, and that is written reprimanded, reprimand, suspicion, demotion, transfer, or even terminal from employment. If you have something related to say racial profiling and that allegation sustained, we actually, as Heritage Affairs, our commander has a saying on that. He will review that. And if he found it, that person will be disciplined. And there is a discipline entity that calls a discipline, uh, department discipline office that will uh, the overview that discipline action. And to, to pick up on, on your, you made a comment about racial profiling. So within the complaint process, and this would go for, for anyone on the panel, within the complaint process, are you monitoring that, that data to see how, what might have a racial impact? And also, are you sharing that information with the public, either the findings of it and the process itself? As far as that, uh, the commander of Heritage Affairs, he does review and he has access uh, to that. And did he, if, if, if a pattern's racial connotation and bias uh, based profiling found, then when discipline comes in. But as far as the commander of Heritage Affairs, yes, he can review um, those uh, elements and ensure that uh, such act is not permitted within the, the troop. And then in Pottstown, are you also monitoring to see whether or not there's a differential impact by race? Yes, we have, we have a program and a system that's in place uh, that records, documents, and tracks complaints uh, and disciplines. Thank we, you. Those are not released to the public. They would be released to the complainant of the, that made the complaint, of the civilian that made the complaint. Um, but generally, um, officers' disciplines are not released to the, to the public. So I'd, I'd like to bring in um, Trooper Butler and Trooper Smith into this question. And um, Trooper Smith, you've, you've talked about your community involvement and community engagement um, in many ways already. And actually, Trooper Butler, you've done it 
as well. But I mean, as we look at this, many people are looking at the fact that in order for police either departments or um, even if we're looking at state police for it to function effectively, effect, effectively, there needs to be some type of community relationship. So I remember Chief you know, Markovich saying like, you have to get out of the car and walk and talk. So it's not enough to get out of the car. You also need to have um, that, that conversation. And so as we're looking at you know, building trust within the community and then also looking at this shared responsibility for public safety, what I wanna ask you two, if you could comment on what more can be done to not only promote this public trust in police, but also to reduce um, racial profiling beyond implicit bias training. And um, Trooper Smith, like you noted that you went, attended one for the state, but that it was optional. So if you could just speak a little bit about that, what more can be done to instill this trust and also to, to eliminate racial profiling? And we'll start with Trooper Smith since you're unmuted already. Sure. So I think more conversations and more listening and also more education. So police, we're members of the communities and we want to see our communities thrive and succeed. I think conversations and listening is just so important because it all comes down to the fact that we all have the best interest of our community at heart and an education. Um, trainings and reading as much as possible to be more aware as to what's going on and then listening, not just hearing, but actually listening um, is so important right now. Thank you. Trooper Butler. Yes, just to piggyback off of what Trooper Smith said, she said listening and uh, engaging uh, the community in conversation. Uh, there's a reason, someone said, there's a reason why we have two ears and one mouth. You know what I'm saying? I think it's more important to listen. You know, once you listen to the community's uh, problems and, and concerns, that you can, you can better uh, effectively address those concerns. Um, and more importantly, I think, uh, I think Citizens Police Academies would, would definitely uh, be advantageous to bridging the gap between law enforcement and community. Um, especially that, I mean, because it, it gives the community uh, the ability to take a walk in our shoes, quote unquote, just a little bit to, to see what it is that we do, uh, just to see under what rules and what regulations that we operate under to understand that what we do is justified. And, and I speak uh, and I'm thinking about an example uh, uh, for an example, a car stop. You know, some individuals don't believe they have the right or, or they believe they have the right to not show ID on a car stop, you know, and they're like, well, you know, I don't have to show you anything. Well, yes, you do. State law, uh, according to the uh, uh, the vehicle code, the crimes code, you, you do have to show ID. It, it's law says you have to carry ID for identification purposes. Just just something as simple as that, you know, that that that, you know. I believe citizens police academies empowers the community. They know uh, what it is they can and cannot do. They have a better understanding instead of just going off a of big, you know, based off of what they believe or, or what the media says or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So I think citizens police academy will definitely be, be advantageous and just to continue to do what we're, what we're doing now. And I mean, uh, in police work and any type of profession, there's always going to be challenges, you know what I'm saying? And it's important important for the community to understand that you can't categorize every uh, 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 every law enforcement officer just because of a few bad apples. And I know bad apples, you know, just that quote unquote, you know what I'm saying? And in, in, in all professions, you're going to have malpractice and misconduct. You know what I'm saying? If I, if I, I've been to several Applebee's and when I, the waiters, you know, they took a long time to refill my, my Coca-Cola. You know, I, I was upset about that, but I'm not going to take my anger and frustration out on every waiter or waitress that work at Applebee's, you know, just as, as an example, you know what I'm saying? But um, I just believe that we should just continue to do what we're doing, maybe do a little more of it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. I can just piggyback off what Trooper Butler said. So just so everybody listening is aware, Citizens Police Academy is a free community-based program that the state police officers offer, offers, and I'm, I know other local departments offer it as well. And it's a way, as Trooper Butler said, to learn about 
what the state police does. You get to learn about our patrol functions, our criminal investigations, traffic stops. Um, we talk about use of force. You get to an all encompassing view of our department. So please check your local community, your local state police station, or your local police department for when a state, uh, Citizens Police Academy program might be coming in your community in the near future, because it's a really great way to learn about the department that serves your community. Do you, do you know if those are well utilized by the public and whether they've been seen to be effective in terms of improving relations between police and citizens? Absolutely. I've coordinated three of them around my troop in different areas. We like to move it around so that way people in different communities have access to it and they are very well attended. And we try to bring a hands-on, all-encompassing view of the state police to it. So the last one that I coordinated, we set up mock traffic stops. We brought in a use of force simulator. So it was it's kind of like a video game, but it puts the participants in a, a scenario where they have to make the decision if they should use force or not use force. So it really gave them an eye-opening look at, wow, you have to make a decision in a split second. We reconstructed a crash scene. So it's really great that you can learn about the different facets of the state police that you might not be aware of. And I really enjoy it because I get to meet members of my community as well. And if there's questions, if there's concerns, it's a great way to learn about what's going on in the communities that we serve. Chief Markovich, do you have any um, thoughts on what more can be done to help promote this trust and build the relationship, a strong relationship between police and citizens? Yeah, I think, well, first, <clears throat> policing doesn't work if you don't have the support of the community. And um, there's all different styles of policing, community-based policing, prob problem-oriented policing, which are probably two of the the best, but it's, it'd be nice if we would just get down to some common sense policing or just do the right thing policing. And I said to a couple guys once like, police like your mom and your grandmom are standing next to you. Treat people like you want your family members to be treated by a police officer. And it's actually very simple. It's just communication. It's just talking to people or listening to people like Trooper Butler said. Um, you don't always have to be the authority figure standing over people, watching people. You don't have to police everybody. You can just be there to protect or just be there to talk or, or just be there. You don't always have to be the police. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but sometimes it's too, it's too much. Just use some common sense and treat people the way you want your family to be treated. And things will usually work out a lot better. And so our, our time is starting to wind down for this segment. One of my questions was related to the um, independent oversight body and, and we, we have addressed that um, earlier. So I'll actually skip past that one. And if we have time, we can come back to it later. But what I would like for each one of you to, to respond to is really give one or two very, very concrete steps related to change and, and what it would take. So when we think about this on both sides, there is support for change. On both sides, there's definitely uh, an understanding that relationships need to be need to be improved. So just two very two steps, if you could say, that should be taken to for systemic change to happen. One or two steps that are needed for systemic change to happen. Ishmael, did you want to start? Yes, I'll take that. I think two things, education and engagement. Uh, we need to educate as police officer others of how we, uh, our process is. And we want the community to be educated about us. Then we want to be engaged in our communities because we are part of the community. We're going nowhere. Uh, and as a part of the community is learning about us, and teaching you it's both ways goes uh so engagement we want because i'll tell you from my community whenever i talk to them they are afraid to engage we need to engage we need to hold each other's arm and look to a brighter future and i'll go based on what my view is so um trooper smith you're next 
Sure. So I think more listening, more conversations, and, and more inclusion for change to happen. It takes everyone. So we all need to be part of these conversations. We all need to actively listen. We need to learn uh, and keep the conversations going. This is something that we need to keep talking about. Um, and it takes everyone. It takes inclusion. And can you just talk a little bit more about inclusion? So who are you saying needs to be included? Everybody. So I think a lot of times it's we're viewing it as one side versus the other side, but it takes everybody. We all have to come together and have this conversation. And and that's how change can happen when when we're all coming together, we're all talking about it and we're all listening. Trooper Butler, what are your two very concrete steps for creating change? Trooper, Trooper Ishmael and Trooper Kelly, it's hard to top those. I'm just going to piggyback off of what they said. Uh, Trooper Ishmael said engagement, and I think that's a that's a huge part. You know what I'm saying? You got to engage the community. And I, I would also add compassion. Uh, compassion is a quality that every law enforcement officer should possess before signing up. You know what I'm saying? I, to me, it's the umbrella in which all other good, good qualities fall under. If you operate out of compassion, you know what I'm saying? There's not going to be misconduct or malpractice. You know what I'm saying? When you, 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 when you have compassion, you have the ability to empathize, not sympathize, but empathize. You know what I'm saying? And what I say, what I mean by that, and I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, on a car stop, you know, you see that, you know, and you can use common sense, uh, you know, common sense. And, you know, you see a, a, a maybe a single a uh, parent, mother with a kid, a baby in the back, you know, you see all types of traffic violations, you know, uh, do you go ahead and cite her for every single traffic violation you see? No, you know what I'm saying? Compassion, empathy, you know what I'm saying? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe give her a warning, you know what I'm saying? But compassion is very important. Um, and like uh, Trooper Ishmael said, uh, engaging, uh, you know, you got to engage the com uh, the uh, the community and in conversation, you know what I'm saying. You have two ears, one mouth. You got to listen first in order to be effective. You know what I'm saying. So listen to the concerns and complaints of the community and address them accordingly. So I have. Thank you, Chief Markovich. I hate to repeat what everyone else said, but there's there's no doubt that communication is the key to everything. I mean, and that's what we're doing here right now. Um, and again, we're a small town in Pottstown, and I'm very grateful to work here. And, and as a police department, we have to lead the way, but we are very fortunate with the community we have. Um, a lot of the community knows the police officers by name. Um, if you walk down the street, you'll hear people call out officers' names. Uh, I'm not saying there's not issues. And again, I'm by no means saying we're perfect and we need to continue getting, getting better. Um, but a better interaction, more interaction with the community, and it has to be led by the police department to make those things happen. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll turn it over to Stacy now. Thank you so much. This has been really great and really informative. I was just kind of going through the chat to see if we missed any questions. The YWCA team has been doing a good job of um, putting answers into the chat and also links to some of the questions that people are asking about um the citizen police academy and and things like that i think there might be one unanswered question um probably I, i'm not sure who might answer it but conversations about policies regarding grievances um are have a lot of focus on uh police unions right now and can any of you speak to that and the inability to really discipline an officer because of union protection? Um, well, officers do have uh, union protection and I could, I could speak on it. I was once the president of the, the Pottstown Police Officers Association, but um, I, I guess it depends on what, what exactly you're talking about it to be more specific because sure. so most, if officers, if I... most officers, most officers, I don't want to say they don't, they want to see bad officers dealt with, put, put it that way. They don't want officers that are doing things wrong 
or that they're seeing done wrong out on the street or inappropriate or excessive. The normal good police officers, and that's what most officers are, are good police officers. The overwhelming majority of them want to see the officers dealt with. Um, so yes, there's, there's union protection, um, just like in any job. Every job, most jobs have unions and they are there to protect most of the unions are there in police are for bargaining purposes, for contract purposes. Um, but like any job, there, there's going to be union protection, um, but it doesn't completely govern everything. So, so thank you for that. And I, I just want to clarify a little bit. I think if we, you know, the, the catalyst for this discussion and forum and series was really George Floyd's murder. And one of the things that we learned after his murder was that they had a fairly new, Minneapolis Police Department had a fairly new um, police chief. He had been there for three years. He had come in the wake of the killing of Philando Castile, that he had implemented many, many changes in the police department. And he was thwarted by disciplining this particular officer out of the department um, by the union that was protecting him and, and couldn't really discipline him out. So that was, you know, as we were really kind of doing our research, that's one of the things. And it was, it was, it was visible in Philadelphia at some of the protests, the how the union um, uh, president spoke out. Um, so, you know, it isn't, it isn't an invisible thing to citizens that, you know, police officers could have misconduct. And I think in it, as in any job, right? If I if I do something wrong, I'm, there's going to be a consequence, and it seems to the public that maybe sometimes the consequences are blunted by the union. the The rightful consequence is blunted by the union intervention. So, I mean, that was the that was that was really what what we were thinking about. So, I think we're going to go back through our. Um, YWCA um, CEOs and executive directors for closing remarks. Um, I'll start with G. Yes. <laughs> um, I think this was a really uh, powerful conversation. Uh, it's not an easy conversation to have um, for the community, for law enforcement officers, but it's an important conversation. And I think as a listener and as a participant, I learned a lot. Um, I think I gained a greater respect for the work that police officers do in our country, in our communities. I look forward to um, many of the recommendations, the solutions to make police and community partnerships better. I think there were some concrete um, recommendations. Um, and I'm really excited that the YW has been a part of this conversation and leading this conversation because it resonates so deeply with um, our, our mission in the history of our great organization. So um, thank you to the law enforcement officers. Thank you to all the listeners. I learned a lot and I look forward to doing the work. There's still a lot of work ahead of us and, and I'm looking forward to being a part of it. Thank you, Stacy. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button fast enough. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Mary Quinn from YWCA Greater Harrisburg. Just um, echoing uh, Guy's statement, I mean, I, I learned a lot and I just appreciate um, you showing up. I mean, I think that um, it speaks volumes. I know that these are not probably easy conversations and um, there's just been a lot of hurt uh, in our communities and we're all trying to heal and find solutions at the same time. Um, and so I, I think that we, that we showed up today, all of us, um, um, speaks volumes to our courage and uh, wanting to be have, build better communities for ourselves, our families, uh, our friends. And so just echo echoing a big thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Angela? I want to just commend Stacy and her team again. So Stacy, thank you for pulling this together because this isn't an opportunity that we usually get, right? So being able to not only have officers as part of the conversation, but also to have um, different areas of our state represented and also having it at different levels. So thank you so much for participating in this. 
and I, I want to um, end my comments with with this statement. And so I, I and I think about um, Trooper Smith, and I remember a picture of my daughter. So I have a photo of her having her face painted by one of the police officers in our local zone, right? And so and saw her again when I was in the public library because she was reading to to children. And those connections are important. And on the flip side, so when we did have a, a situation, I'm the mother of two um, African American males, and so when we did have a situation, you know, being able to go down to the zone and feeling comfortable enough to say, I'm not comfortable with what happened because that relationship um, had been built, and I felt that I would be listened to, and I was. So thank you again for just being a part of this, for listening to us, and any ways that YWCA collectively across our state associations can, can help you as we all work together to affect change, please let us know. Thank you so much, Angela. And then I wanted to give, I wanted to give um, each one of you an opportunity for a closing remark. I'll start across my screen. I'll go to, to Mick Markovich, G. I, I just say thank you for the opportunity. Um, and thank you for having us. Um, I, I think there should be more uh, conversations like this. It would be nice if we could do it in person as opposed to the, the Zoom meetings. Um, but of course, we're across the state for this. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of positive things that have come out from conversations like this. And thank you for allowing us to be part of it. Thank you. Well, you know what? We, YWCA Tri-County Area, we're in Pottstown. And I promise to be more of a pain in your butt than I have. Thank you. <laughs> you can look forward to that. Thank you, Ishmael. I really, really appreciate the, this opportunity. We need forums like that. As citizens, the number one thing that we can do is stay involved and keep the lines of communication open, even after the current event fade from the headlines. In addition to the work, you can always reach to us and uh, as heritage affairs section or community officers, community officers, service services officer. There are so many of them through the state and you can always call us, contact us. We'll be happy to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trooper Butler. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for having me. Uh, I believe this was very beneficial. And like uh, Chief Markovich uh, stated, I mean, I would, this needs to be a dialogue that we have on a, on a consistent basis. It's very important. You know what I'm saying? I mean, um, and like uh, Trooper Ishmael said, just maintaining open lines of communication. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's important for us to have a dialogue like this because, I mean, if, if there are issues, you know, I want to hear about it. If there's something that I could do better, please let me know. You know what I'm saying? And that's how I feel about it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I guess, you know, we, we can help each other in that way. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Trooper Smith. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this panel. It was truly an honor. And as Guy and Mary said, these conversations aren't easy. They can be uncomfortable, but I think real growth and change is what comes out of uncomfortableness and it takes bravery and courage to have these conversations and to keep having them. So I'm honored that to be part of this conversation today and I hope to be part of more conversations so we can bring about real change. And to quote High School Musical, we're all in this together. So we all have to work together. <laughs> we're, all, <laughs> we're all on the same team <laughs> and we all wanna see the betterment of our communities. Thank you so much. So I, I thank all of our panelists and all the law enforcement. Um, I hope everybody can just kind of give them a, a round of applause, put your, your hand claps up in, the, in your chat thing. Um, I also wanted to just say, please join us for the next session in this virtual summer series, which is gonna be on July 8th. Um, there'll be information about it in our chat. I wanna again, thank all of our law enforcement officials who joined us tonight. I wanna thank our sister YWs, uh, YWCA Greater Pittsburgh, YWCA Greater Harrisburg, and YWCA Butts. Should I call you brother YW? I don't know. I'm always um, not sure about that. 
Um, I also just wanted to um, make sure that um, everybody continues to join us, like our panelists uh, and our law enforcement, please join us for the next part of the series. I think that it's that the journey that we will do together to quote Kelly Smith from High School Musical is that if we're all in it together, we have to all be in it together. And so, um, I, you know, I thank you so much. Um, and my, I just really would like to close with a, co a quote. Uh, Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And Benjamin Franklin said that, and I think that's where we are right now today. The, those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are affected. And I think that together we are really gonna make this change. So please, we're gonna keep the chat on for a few minutes. We're ending a few minutes early. So hopefully you'll get back some of your evening, but um, join us in the next session of the series on July 8th and um, have a great evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>